Well, good morning. The story of enabling enterprise and, uh, and this story really begins a decade ago. And at the time, I was uh, a very uh, fresh-faced new teacher, uh, to the extent that I have 14-year-old students who look decidedly uh, older than me. I often got told to tuck my shirt in. Um, and on one memorable occasion, deputy head stuck her head in and asked who the responsible adult in the room was, which would have been fine had I not been mid-lesson uh, teaching from the front. Um, and as a new teacher, there's a sort of new teacher bingo that you tick off, particularly if you're working in a, in a more challenging school. So, you know, uh, child throws thing at you, tick. Uh, child tries to escape through window, tick. Uh, child sets light to textbook, tick. Um, but actually what struck me more than those individual incidents was, I suppose, a growing sense of dissonance. And a dissonance between what I was seeing in the classroom, my 14 and 15-year-old students, and the growing reality that actually they were about to embark on the rest of their lives. And in my classroom, that sort of gap manifested itself as, you know, being unable to um, run a lesson without managing the seating plan and working out exactly who was friends with who at that particular moment. Or when I'd ask a question, no one would put their hands up. And that was just about acceptable in the classroom because we were marching towards getting a good, good grade. But what would come after that? After that might be college. And I knew that in college they wouldn't have the same sort of uh, individual teacher looking out for them, trying to make sure everything was done on time, making sure coursework was there. And if they got beyond college and if they decided they wanted to go to university, I knew that one in 12 freshers from a more disadvantaged background drop out in their first year of university. And academics are increasingly saying that actually their undergraduates simply aren't prepared uh, for the rigours of university and the need to manage their own learning, to be problem solvers, to be an analytical. And beyond university, employers were saying the same thing too. So every year the employee survey, employer survey came out which said pretty consistently over a decade that 50% of employers were concerned about the teamwork and the problem solving and the analytical and self-management skills of their school and college leavers. And as a naive new teacher, I looked at that and I looked around my classroom and I just couldn't understand why we were so unconcerned about what appeared to me to be a massive gaping hole in the middle of the education that we were providing for our young people. But as a new teacher, what was I going to do about this? Well, actually swirling around were all of these different ideas of some of the things that might fill that gap. So everything from basic skills to 21st century skills to advanced skills. Basic skills and advanced skills turn out to be the same thing. Uh, maybe we could have gone for some middling skills or something like that. But you're surrounded by these different ideas of what you could do, but how to make sense of it, and how to make sense of it in a context, and this is a reenactment, uh, in a context uh, <laughs> where actually what you're trying to do is to get through a subject curriculum and try and make sure your students got good grades as well. Um, and so on that basis, I set up Enabling Enterprise as a social enterprise eight years ago. And the idea was simple, was how can we support teachers to fill this missing piece in their students' education. Because actually every teacher is motivated to want the very best for their students. Every teacher wants to develop their students in the broadest, uh, most helpful way. And yet there was no clear way of doing it. And so what we've done is try to make sense of all these different things that go on out there. So we like confidence, we like patience, we like humility. We think kids should be financially literate. Uh, we think it'd be great if they were team players too. And the problem is when we try and do all of these different things, we forget the fact that actually these are all very different things. And what we're really doing is slightly confusing the idea of character, knowledge, and skills. And I think a great education does all of these three things. A great education should help students to build their character. It should obviously equip them with a great deal of knowledge and understanding of the world so they can navigate it effectively. But they also need skills. They need the ability to do things. And I think often that's the bit in our education that we forget. So in Enabling Enterprise, what we do is we just focus on those skills. We know that students need the ability to do. And what's really exciting is when you just think about skills, you find that actually the skills that young people need is, are pretty consistent. And so we talk about eight at Enabling Enterprise. Uh, so we talk about communication skills of listening and presenting. We talk about problem solving creativity. We talk about self-management in terms of staying positive and aiming high, so having big goals, having plans, and then actually having the strategies and tools to stick at achieving them, and then finally being able to work with others with teamwork and leadership. Now, these all look like very sensible, some would say obvious things that we could be building. 
But what's even more exciting as we started digging into this at Enabling Enterprises, we realized to really stretch the metaphor, um, or to mix the metaphor, in fact, uh, if you crack in uh, to any one of those individual skills, you realize that they're all built up of these chunks. Everything is built up of chunks. And once you break down the chunks of, say, taking teamwork, and instead of just doing teamwork activities, think about teaching, taking in turns, helping out with different jobs, maybe how to facilitate a team meeting, you realize that these are completely teachable. So if we break these skills apart, we realize that you can teach them in just the same rigorous way as you would anything else. So we know there's a massive gap. On a big screen now, I realize it looks like I'm smirking. There wasn't a smirk at this point. Um, so we know there's a gap. We know that there's these skills that would fill the gap. We know we can break them down into teachable chunks. And so the question is, why, was, uh, why aren't we doing it? Why isn't this just a part of education? And I think there's some barriers. There's, firstly, there's practical barriers, right? There's a lot in a school curriculum. Schools have limited resources, they have limited time, they have limited money. Of course, you can't do everything. But Enabling Enterprise in this last year alone has worked with almost 300 schools, perfectly normal primary and secondary schools, and 85,000 students in them. And we found that that's not really a reason for those students not to take part. So maybe then it's something deeper. Maybe there's some sort of uh, philosophical barrier. So maybe on one end, uh, people think of you know, education as you know, producing economically efficient units or children, uh, students, um, which is definitely one end of a spectrum. Uh, at the other end, we might say, actually, it's all about developing a, a rich cultural and spiritual and moral appreciation, which is the other. But I think whichever end you sit on, if you care about students as economic units, and for the record, I, that, that isn't my driver, um, then actually, of course, we want the skills because employers have said those skills are essential. If, on the other hand, we care about that wider development, well, actually, you still need the skills because that's what makes it possible for students to access and make the most of their time in school. So it's not something philosophical, so what is it? And over the last year, when I've been thinking and writing about this and trying to draw together our experience, I think what's really crystallized is there are three myths that we need to get over if we're really going to take this stuff seriously, if we're going to think differently about our education system. And the three myths are often quite hard to pin down. The first is this idea that skills are innate. So we are just born with them. And that might seem silly when I say it out loud, but actually we talk very easily about natural leaders, natural communicators, natural team players. And actually I think there's an element where we assume and we mix up personality and skill. The characteristics we have and our ability to do things. So for example, we might often presume that an introvert can't be a leader. In fact, the evidence is that introverts are often more effective leaders. Or equally, we might assume that someone who's neurotic wouldn't be able, to, um, be able to manage a team. In fact, again, there's no evidence that those two things are linked. So we need to get beyond this idea that skills are innate, because we're seeing increasingly in all sorts of fields, including sports, including uh, academic um, qualifications, we're seeing that actually deliberate practice is much more likely to be correlated with having a skill than any sort of innate uh, characteristic. But if we get over that, we have this idea that, well, maybe you can build skills, but very hard to do it directly. We sort of have this idea uh, that you sort of pick these things off, up by osmosis. So if you do enough activities, and this is stretching a biology metaphor now, and we all have permeable membranes for these experiences, we can, over time, by doing lots of things, build up a high level of competence. And of course, it gives more opportunities, but actually, it's a really, really inefficient way of learning. It's basically the same as saying the best way for children to learn to read is to unleash them in a library. And we sort of hope that over time, they'll pick up the right book, maybe they'll teach each other. I don't know, but you know, that's the best we can do. So we'll lock them in that library until they come out as proficient readers. Or well, the third idea, which is sort of a, a hangover, I guess, from sort of entrepreneurial thinking, is this idea that the skills lie latent. They're deep within us. And then the right opportunity emerges, suddenly we'll be able to do it. Again, it doesn't really, there's no evidence for that. Uh, there's no evidence that we have these things innately and that we can just bring them to the fore when we need to. But actually, these, uh, these myths really drive a lot of how we think about these skills in education. And what we really need to do if we're going to make a breakthrough and we're going to get every child and every young person to build these skills, we need to make a big leap in our thinking. 
We need to stop thinking about these skills as nice to have things, but maybe their personality, and instead think about them in the same way we think about two skills that we are very comfortable with teaching, and that is literacy, the ability to read and write, and numeracy, the ability to work with numbers. And of course, when you apply those myths to anything to do with literacy or numeracy, we immediately see how silly they are. And what we've seen increasingly is that actually, when you take that and you take that completely different viewpoint on these skills in our education system, there are six things that we need to dramatically change about how mainstream schooling thinks about these skills. First is that we need to keep it simple. We need to be focused consistently on a single set of eight skills uh, because if we don't do that, then actually we continue to get confused about what we're teaching we teach in different ways. We need to start really young. So enabling enterprise works with kids from as young as three years old. Now, at three years old, you're not worried particularly about employability, but of course, if a three-year-old can interact with their peers, if they can um, be happy and confident sharing their ideas, then you're putting them on a completely different trajectory for the rest of their time in school. So we start young and we keep going. We measure it. So in the same way that you teach reading effectively by knowing a student's reading age, if you know what a student can and can't do in these skills, of course you can work out what level they're working at in that as well, which means that you can then focus really tightly on the next thing that they need to learn. So if the next thing that they need to learn to become a better presenter is how to, and I always feel self-conscious using this example here, uh, <laughs> that actually how do you uh, stand? How do you talk? How do you uh, put your points in logical order? We can break these things down. We can teach exactly the thing um, that a student needs to learn next. Then we keep practicing it. So we reinforce it and we reinforce it in lots of different settings and we bring it to life by linking those skills built in the classroom. We have to link it to the real world. We have to be taking our young people out of the classroom into employers and we have to be taking employers into the classroom because that's the only way to build the transferability of those skills. So we know now that these skills are teachable. We know what it would take to do it uh, in schools across the country. Uh, Enabling Enterprise has said we've seen it work uh, now with in excess of 250,000 students over the last eight years. So we know it works. So what would it take for this to be something that every student got as a, as a matter of course? I think we need to believe three things collectively. The first is that we need to believe that these essential skills are as important as any other part of a child's time in school. And we need to put them at the heart of learning. The second thing, and actually this is more contentious because we rarely have arguments about people who don't think the skills are important, but we need to believe that every student can build them. We need to have that expectation just as we expect every child can be literate and numerate when they leave school, so they need to have these skills. And thirdly, we need more of a common language and shared expectations about what that looks like. And so we're working with about 50 other organisations now to try and have that same language, same expectations, so our work can reinforce itself. We've got a long way to go. So enabling enterprises in 1.2% of English schools, which is, you know, sobering after eight years of work. But actually, the development of literacy and numeracy should give us great hope. Because, you know, 100 years ago, it was thought, A, that most people probably couldn't become literate or numerate. And actually, would that even be a sensible use of resources to try and get people to that stage? And actually, what we've seen since we made that commitment is rounds of development of reading ages, of standardised grammar, of standardised mathematic notation, which has allowed us to get to a point where actually this is an expectation for everyone. And we'll need to do that because in the future these skills are only going to become more important. And it's become very usual to talk now about how knowledge-rich jobs are going to be less important because automation and algorithms make them so. But actually our education system isn't balancing it out by developing the skills that students will need and the things that will differentiate them from machines. And we're not doing that in the consistent way that we need to. So there's a lot to look forward to. But I often find myself thinking back to my original class 10 years ago. And many of them I keep in touch with. Many of you sheer force of energy and hard work to really get ahead. But I look at them and I look at uh, my experience of school, and I think actually that those students haven't necessarily achieved the potential that they could have had. And I wish that I could have gone back 10 years earlier still to when they were just five or six years old, when they were still building their understanding of the world and where they fitted in, when there was still time to get in early to build empathy and resilience. Because the jobs that they get now aren't the jobs they could have got. They 
uh, they fall behind their wealthier peers when they don't show the essential skills at the outset and don't get marked as the one to watch. And what I wish is that for all of our students, we weren't so quick to assume their capacity without building these skills. What we should do for every child, along with building their literacy and their numeracy, is ensure they leave school equipped with a full set of essential skills. Because we can. Thank you very much. Thank you.